1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuller, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Shula will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. is made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, and welcome, church family. We are so happy you are here this morning. Thank you for being here. And you know, the scripture in the Bible that says, love your neighbor as yourself is not just for our neighbors, it's also for us. Psychologists agree that the majority of depression, of addiction, of workaholism, of suicide attempts comes from a place of not bonding with others. So may the Lord bless us with the ability to bond deeply with each other, and may we love each other profoundly. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. Today we're going to just enjoy our Sabbath and enjoy each other's company and worship Jesus. And that's a good enough reason to be here, don't you think? Amen. So Father, we thank you for calling us into this place. Pray that you'd call us to bond deeply with one another. Help us to live every moment with courage. Help us to be thankful for every breath, everything. Lord, we are just so grateful for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Voices of Hope Choir, directed by Sarah Grand Prix. Thank you. In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord found in Matthew. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus knew he was approaching death on his way to Jerusalem. We church family are also being courageous by taking first steps in our lives, amen.
happiness genetic? Is it a choice? Is it an achievement or a skill that can be developed? Where does happiness come from and how can it even be defined? In this series, Bobby Shuler challenges us to embrace a flourishing, happy life. Though philosophical, theological and even controversial, Imagine Happiness will change the way you view the world, the Bible and your own existence. This week we have 10 DVDs to give away of Bobby Shuler's series called Imagine Happiness. If you've never contacted our New Zealand office before, email or call us today to make sure you get your copy of the Imagine Happiness DVD. Please contact us on 0800 14 HOPE, that's 0800 144 673, or write to us, PO Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland 1344, or hourofpower.org.nz. Thank you for watching today. We love you, and Shepherd's Grove is a community that is rooting for you. If you need anything, we want you to come down to this church and worship with us. If you live in the California, Orange County area, come down and worship with us on a, on a Sunday morning. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving? We're going to say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. It takes courage to be a great person and to do great things with God, and courage begins with a single step. You know, things sometimes when in our spiritual lives don't always make sense. We believe, especially in this church, that God is for you. He's not against you. We believe God has the victory for you. We believe God is going to get you through what you're going through. But often in that process, we can feel confused when bad things happen. And we can wonder, where is God in the midst of all of this? And I have a very dramatic but true answer to that looming question. And the answer is, this is war. And what I mean by that is we are not, as Christians, in a physical war. We're in a spiritual war. There is a spiritual fight going on over your soul and over the destiny of the world. And we know Jesus Christ has won and will win. Yet we still are in the midst of a real spiritual struggle. I've been on enough missionary trips. I've seen enough miracles. I have seen enough crazy spiritual things to believe with all my heart this is a spiritual battle. And I don't understand it. I simply trust. In the Bible, the book of Daniel, there's this story where Daniel is praying to God for three weeks and is not getting a response. And nothing's happening and he's wondering what's going on. And one day, an angel appears before him, so terrifying that everybody that's with Daniel runs away. And Daniel stands there sort of paralyzed. And the angel says, essentially, Daniel, God sent me here to you. But I was delayed, the Bible says, because the prince of Persia, we, had, we think of that as a, like, a, a, like a demon or something, that this this thing was stopping me, and so we were fighting. And I had to fight him to get to you, and we were at an impasse. And so Archangel Michael came and aided me and helped me break through so that I could get through, and we had the victory, and now I'm here to tell you this message from God. Now, I, that story doesn't make any sense to me at all. I do not get that. But what I do gather from that story is that there is a lot going on in the spiritual realms that we don't always get. Maybe because it's super weird. I mean, we just don't understand it. And part of living as a believer, when we have crystal clear eyes to see in this world, but at best a foggy vision of the spiritual world that impacts this world, we are called to live with trust to grow in knowledge, and to act with courage. To be brave. And you are brave. 
and I'm proud of you. Because war requires courage. And war, I know, is a word that's taboo, but that's exactly what it is. We are fighting on the side of light against the darkness. And so whatever it is that you're bringing to God today, face it with courage and step towards the thing you're afraid of, not away. Courage is doing what you are afraid to do. And courage says, I'm going to move not away from, but in the direction of the thing that scares me. And that's who you are. That's what courage is. It's doing what you're afraid to do. You're so brave. You have so much heart. And that's what the word courage is rooted in the French word cur, to have heart. To have heart, to have guts. To face what it is that's coming after you. So what do you have coming after you? You have a surgery? You have uh, a sick kid? Uh, Maybe it means standing up to a bully. Maybe for your courage this week is going to be having that talk that you've needed to have for a long time with that particular person. Maybe courage is asking a girl for her phone number. (laughs) Whatever it is, I know this. An extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. And you have it. And I'm proud of you. You're not afraid. You're not a weakling. You're strong. And you will step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of. And you will have the victory. And that's what makes it so sweet. The victory, right? The victory. You're going to have the victory. Step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of. Because it's the only thing standing between you and your victory in Jesus' name. His name is the name that gives us courage. If anything can give you courage, let it be the bravest human being that has ever lived, Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, Jesus still was human, struggled, had all of the temptations that we have, and I believe including fear. Why do I believe that? Well, just look at the prayer in Gethsemane. But he acted in spite of those feelings of fear, angst, or whatever you want to call it. Jesus is the epitome of what it means to be courageous. To live every moment bravely against the thing you're afraid of for the sake of another or for the good. Jesus was courageous. And that's the message today when we remember the story of him entering into Jerusalem. You ever had something you've dreaded for a while? Maybe you know that feeling. Maybe it was finals week in high school or college. Or maybe you just knew something bad was going to happen in a week. Or maybe you had to give a speech you didn't want to give. Or it's just something you were dreading, you know, worried about it. I often think, did Jesus have those feelings when he thought about the cross? I think he did. Did he dread it? Was it bothering him? Was it, an, was it nagging? I think it did. And he overcomes that worry and that fear uh, when he enters Jerusalem. A lot of people don't know this, but the story of Lazarus and entering Jerusalem are essentially connected into one narrative in the Gospel of John. In John, you have this story. There's uh, three people, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And the three of them are siblings, and they're friends with Jesus. And Jesus gets word that uh, Lazarus is sick. He said, come heal Lazarus, and Jesus delays for two days. Finally, it's like he just comes to it, and he says, we have to go to Bethany to heal Lazarus. Now, here's something you need to know. This is towards the end of the story of the Gospels. Jesus is already getting famous, and he knows if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. You're going to get crucified. So he knows this. He's carrying this worry with him. And Bethany, where Lazarus lives, is like a suburb of Jerusalem. It's one and a half miles from the city. It's a 20-minute walk. And so it's basically going to Jerusalem when you go to Bethany. Not quite, but very close. And so he says to his disciples, Guys, we got to go heal Lazarus. And they say to him, If we go there, they're going to kill you. And almost somberly, Jesus looks at them and says, 
our friend Lazarus is sleeping. I need to go and wake him. And then still trying to talk him out of it, they say, but Rabbi, if he's sleeping, I mean, you want a sick guy to sleep. You know, don't wake him up. He's, you know, sick. Won't he get well? And then the Bible says, he just told those knuckleheads plainly. He said, Lazarus is dead. And then there's, you kind of catch that there's this silence. Lazarus, they're all friends with him, is dead. Jesus wants to go there. They're not sure why. And you can get this looming sense like Jesus is going to die. Are we going to get the axe too? And I always love this because it's Thomas Didymus, also known as Doubting Thomas because of his response later in the story. One of the bravest and one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He looks at the disciples and he says, let us go that we may die with him. Yes! I love that. That's courage. That's heart. And you don't see the disciples' response, but you can see they're kind of like, all right. (laughs) So they go to Bethany. And when they get there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And because he was a super popular guy, there were a lot of Jews there, and they were all mourning and weeping. There could have been hundreds, maybe thousands of people there. His sister Martha comes out to Jesus, totally broken up. She says, Lord, if you had, if you'd just been here, you could have saved my brother. She says to him, Martha, your brother will rise again. And she kind of says, I know, I know, he will rise again in the last day of the resurrection. He looks at her and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will not die, but will surely live forever. Pull the stone away. They say, Lord, we can't pull the stone away. He already stinks. That's what the Bible says. He's been dead for four days, and we live in a desert. (laughs) Pull the stone away. And they do, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. With hundreds of people there, who are there to mourn his death, who are there for a dirge, Weeping, Lazarus comes out in his burial clothes and starts tearing them off. And the last thing comes off is that thing from his face. And he's eye to eye with Jesus, his best friend. And he is alive. And everybody freaks out. (laughs) Word spreads like crazy. It's the last huge miracle Jesus does. And everybody hears about it. It gets to the temple priests and the Pharisees. And they say, we need to kill this guy. Why? In the scriptures it says, we're afraid that he'll become so popular that Rome will take the temple away from us. And then there's this bizarre story where a guy named Caiaphas, who was the high priest, who I assume doesn't like Jesus, prophesied, that Jesus would have to die to unite and heal the Jewish people. And on that basis, they go searching for him to capture him, kill him, and torture him. At this point, Jesus then, because there's all these people that are, he's like, to them, uh, I mean, they don't know what this is, but but he's getting mobbed. So he withdraws to a city called Ephraim in the wilderness, And there he waits, he waits for the time of his crucifixion. Out in the wilderness, just praying, just seeking God's face. Did he feel dread? I think so, maybe a little bit. But he knew that God would raise him from the dead. He knew he would have the victory, but he knew he would have to face the cross. Which theologically wasn't just physical torture, and public humiliation. They were hung naked. There was no loincloth or anything. They were beaten. But also we believe that Jesus took on his very body all the shame, sins, pain, loss of every moment of every human being throughout history, past, present, and future in one single moment. So powerful it caused an earthquake when he died. That's a lot of pain. And he knows it. He's so brave. 
And so he goes to Bethany again to visit his now resurrected friend Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they throw a meal in his honor and Mary washes his feet with her hair and perfume to prepare him for his death. And there, hundreds or maybe thousands of people are gathered to see Jesus. Because at this point, it's now Passover. This is what he's waiting for. One of the highest holidays in Judaism. And historians estimate that there were between 500,000 to 2 million people gathered in the little city of Jerusalem. Which is a lot back then. I mean, it's a lot today. It was a lot back then. And everybody's asking, is Jesus going to come? Is Jesus going to come? After the celebration of the resurrection of Lazarus, all these people who are asking, did he really raise you from the dead? Did this really happen? And and hundreds of people are like, we were there. We saw it. It was just a few days ago. It was crazy. They start as a mob walking towards Jerusalem. And a sea of people almost starts walking into the city. And it is that step that Jesus takes in Jerusalem bravely to face the cross. Everybody is smiling. Everybody is saying, Hosanna. I don't think Jesus is smiling. I think he knows what is coming, but he faces it. He faces it. He takes one step across the portal of Jerusalem, and he knows he will never go back. But he also knows the power, the love, and the faithfulness of the Father, that even if he dies, the Father would raise him from the dead. Tremendous story, isn't it? And after that, you see that those disciples carry their whole lives, most of them also martyred, just a deep sense of courage in the face of everything the enemy throws at them. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead, and even more importantly, they saw Jesus raised from the dead. And they knew. They knew. Being a disciple means having courage. It doesn't mean you're fearless. It means you're going to be scared a lot but you're going to choose to go in the direction of the thing that scares you. God will call you to do scary things. You will be brave and have the victory. Courage begins with a single step. And can I tell you, being courageous in a scary world is the only way to live? Society gives you the opposite message. Society wants you to be safe all the time. Society is constantly telling you to be afraid of this, be afraid of that, whether it's news or politicians or your next door neighbor or some folks at church. People are always wanting you to do the safe thing. That is not the way to live. Yes, we want to be safe sometimes and we always want to be wise, but think about the last time you did something kind of courageous or brave. You probably felt more alive than you ever did when you did something safe. Even if it was stupid, you still felt alive. I had that experience with my brother Anthony. We used to go, uh, Chris Jensen, who's here, he and I and a bunch of guys, we used to do this thing once a year called the Coastal Challenge where we'd start at Dana Point Harbor and we would go from there to Laguna Beach. How far is that, Chris? Nine miles. Nine miles, he says. Okay, so it's nine miles, but it's like nine treacherous miles too. It's not like paved. You're going sometimes along, you know, the beach, the sand, but other times it's rocks and you've got to swim through rocks or climb rocks. We found that swimming through rocks was really a bad idea. You know, sometimes you get beat around. We had one guy who got his chest kind of scraped up and another, another guy who busted his toe and it was bleeding the whole time, but we felt alive. <laughs> See, this is usually young, young guys are this way. And the, 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 one of the greatest moments was this time when my brother was like, why do you want to swim all around those rocks? We'll just climb up this hill, and there's a great place you can just jump off into the water. It's not that high. <laughs> so we're like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's go. <laughs> so we get up there. We're climbing. We get up. And it's not a hill. It's a, it's a cliff. We get up there, and it is like Golden Gate Bridge, you know, jump to your death kind of high. <laughs> we're up there on this cliff, and I'm in the front with my brother. He's like, here it is, you jump off of this. And it's like <laughs> We were talking about how high it was, and we debated somewhere between 40 to 60 feet. 
which I don't know if you've ever jumped off a high board, like at a pool, they're usually 10 or 15 feet, and you look from the bottom, you're like, that's kind of high, it's not so bad, and you get up there and you're like, oh my goodness. Okay, that's 10 feet, 60 feet, or 40, I don't know, around there. I look at Anthony and I go, Anthony, if you jump from this thing, you're gonna get hurt or die. And Anthony, I go, if you jump off this thing, you're gonna get hurt or you're gonna die. And Anthony goes, no, it's fine, you can do it, trust me. I was like, Anthony, you can't jump off this thing. And as I'm saying, Anthony, you can't. Imagine you're me and I'm my brother, Anthony. I go, I'm like, Anthony, you can't. And he goes, and off the cliff, he goes. <laughs> <laughs> he does a full 180, like, as he's falling. And I look down, he's still falling. <laughs> and uh, he looks up and he's like, I'm okay. And then being boys, we all know that the longer you take to decide something like, shall I jump from this cliff, the less likely it is that you'll do it and the more likely it is that you'll become the world's big coward of the <laughs> week. So all of us, like lemmings, just shoop, 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 we're jumping off. And uh, I jumped off, and I was fine. <laughs> now, I felt so alive, even though I was beat up, bruised, all of us, eating pizza at the end. <laughs> we actually were alive, which was good. <laughs> but doing brave things, like jumping off of cliffs into the ocean and things like that are, are some of the most spectacular moments of our lives. We feel so mastered by scary things, don't we? Pushed around, controlled by the things we fear. And Jesus tells us, well, if you live by faith, you can move a mountain. Courage is stepping into Jerusalem, stepping toward the very thing you're afraid of, and you will. That's your character. You've got heart. You've got cur courage. To be courageous means to be alive. Naturally, after a story about jumping off a cliff, you might ask, well, hey, Bobby, what's the difference between courage and stupidity? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. Uh, courage, unlike stupidity, is rooted in knowledge. Just because you have the knowledge doesn't mean it's not scary. I remember my first ropes course. Have you ever been on that? A ropes course? It's terrible. It's a horrible experience. You look like, you look so silly. They give you this harness and you've got two ropes, you've got a helmet, and you feel like a baby in like a jumper. And <laughs> They, you're supposed to walk as a team building exercise across this gauntlet that'll sometimes be 120 feet in the air. And you know you're safe. You're completely safe. Like nobody ever gets hurt, and nor would they. You're so safe. And yet your whole body kicks into gear like, don't do this, don't you dare do this. <laughs> Courage is rooted in knowledge, and the knowledge that I'm going to be okay allows me to step out. But it's not enough. Courage is the thing that says, I'm going to take that first step. Courage is rooted in knowledge. I remember when I moved to Oklahoma, I was about 15, and my parents made the wise decision of taking me to a horror movie called Twister. Is that what it was called? <laughs> and uh, a movie about how giant tornadoes kill people. <laughs> the movie was filmed in Oklahoma, and then we're moving there. Could get a lay of the land. So I had this looming fear of tornadoes for a long time. I, I would have dreams about tornadoes. I still have dreams about tornadoes from time to time. And so I had this like, you know, fear of tornadoes. And I had it up and through college. I remember when we first moved there, there was these humongous storms. If you live in Oklahoma, the Midwest, you know. I mean, we've never had a storm like that here in California. I mean, thunder, lightning, bolts of lightning hitting outside your house over and over. It was crazy. Anyway. So then I went to go speak at this church in college. And I went with a friend of mine, Don, and we're staying at the pastor's house. And it's, a, it's storming bad. And we're looking on TV, it says tornado warning. That means there's a funnel cloud or something in the area. And my heart is starting to race a little bit. 
because now this thing that I've been afraid of for a long time is upon me. And, and I think the pastor could see that I was afraid. I was a young guy. I was like 18. He looks at me and he goes, Bobby, don't even worry about it. If there's going to be a tornado, you'd hear a siren. And I swear it was like you were in a movie. As soon as he said that, a cop car goes flying down the street. And then I'm like, and the funniest thing was Don and this pastor, both Oklahomans, all they did was just laugh. <laughs> and I'm, so then they take his wife and his kids, and for safety's sake, they put them in the basement. And then they go out onto their porch to see if they can find the tornado. <laughs> they turn and look with me, and the pastor, I kid you not, looks at me and goes, you can go downstairs with the ladies if you like. <laughs> So I go outside. I, I took one step in the direction of the thing I was afraid of. And I stood on that porch, and the pastor goes, oh, oh, there it is. Right there, see? And you see this tiny little thing in this cloud, and it goes, Gone. And Don goes, it's an F1. It's not a big deal. I was like, what does that even mean? It's a tornado. He's like, well, you got your F1, and you got your F5, and you got your F3. He's like, he goes, it's just a little tornado. It won't hurt anybody. You grab a tree, you'd be fine. <laughs> That's not true, by the way. That's a very Oklahoma thing to say. And the reason I tell you that story is, is that their lack of fear of that particular tornado was in the knowledge of how small it was. And that tornadoes really aren't that dangerous most of the time. Now, there's some that can be brutal. But in this case, a little F1 funnel cloud, it was still probably not super smart. But they just weren't worried because they were, they'd experienced probably hundreds of tornadoes living out in the boonies of Oklahoma. You know, it just wasn't a big deal for them. They're like, ah, if it gets close enough, I'll just go in the shelter, I guess. You see, fear, fear is very often legitimate. But sometimes we're way more afraid than we need to be. And the difference between courage and bravery is courage is rooted in knowledge. And in 2008 and 2009, Warren Buffett said, put your money in the stock market. This is the time to get rich. Warren Buffett's the wealthiest man in the world sometimes. It's always changing. But he's considered the greatest investor of all time. And he said, lots of people have bet against America. They've always failed. He said, bet on America, invest in the stock market. Most people didn't. And you know, everybody was terrified, but there was, a, there was a few unicorns that said, at the very bottom, I'm going to buy some stock. And those people would have made a lot of money. To be courageous at that time would have been to do something scary, but rooted in knowledge. And Warren Buffett, being the most knowledgeable investor of all time, had great advice. Some followed it, some didn't. But courage is rooted in knowledge. Again, it doesn't mean it's not scary. Taking one step towards the thing you're afraid of just because you know you're going to have the victory doesn't make it, you know, the fear go away. It still makes it difficult. And very often what we do is instead of taking a step in the direction of the thing we're afraid of, we don't run away, but we get busy on other things. We do a little bit of this and we do a little bit of that and we keep going and somehow that makes us feel like I'll get around to it, but right now I'm kind of busy. And our busyness becomes Avoidance. It's a way we avoid fulfilling our destiny. Because the only thing between you and your destiny is the thing you are busy avoiding. The only thing between you and your destiny is that big thing you're afraid of. God called you to do it because it's scary and nobody else will. And that's why disciples must have heart, heart to move in the direction of the violent, crazy, scary thing they're afraid of, rooted in the knowledge of God's character. God is faithful, he is strong enough, he is loving, 
he will give you the victory, but it doesn't mean it won't be hard work, and it doesn't mean it won't be scary. So whatever you're facing, my friends, I want you to know the word from God to you is don't stay busy, don't avoid, don't procrastinate. Take one small step in the direction of that big thing you're afraid of. Sometimes that's all it takes. I want you to know the victory is going to be yours. It's overwhelming to think about whatever it is that you're facing. If you look at the whole thing, sometimes it can be very worrisome. But remember the wise words of a wise man long ago who said, a thousand mile journey begins with a single step. That's right. Just take one step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of. And God will give you the victory. Amen. I don't want to let you leave here today, especially in a sermon about courage, without giving you the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. And so today, I'm not going to keep you here long. I just want to offer you the chance. Maybe you come to church today, and you know, if my heart stopped beating today, I mean, are you at peace with God? I believe the first act of becoming a believer is an act of courage. It's acknowledging that you need God in front of others. And so I'm going to invite you in just a moment to stand and acknowledge that you need to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And by doing this, God, God says, anybody who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before the Father. But anyone who de denies me before men, I will deny before the Father. And so would you stand just where you are right now, if you want me to pray with you to receive the Lord this morning? Just right where you are. If you need to receive the Lord in your life today, stand up. We want to pray with you. Today's going to be a different day for you. And so, church, we're going to say this together. And if you're standing at church, would you just extend a hand towards those, these people that are standing this morning? And you, friends, just hold your hands out like this to receive grace from God. And all of us, let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Son, of God, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I am the righteousness of Christ. I am chosen, blessed, called. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Forgive me of my sins. Teach me to walk as Jesus walked. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Stay standing. We love you guys. Father, thank you for all you're doing. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this hopeful service of Hour of Power. Don't forget, we can send you these services on CD or DVD. Just contact us. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to stay up to date with what is happening with Hour of Power New Zealand, please like us on Facebook. Just look for Hour of Power New Zealand. You can also call us on 0800 14 HOPE. That's 0800 144 673. Write to us at PO Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland 1344. Or jump on our website, hourofpower.org.nz. Is happiness genetic? Is it a choice? Is it an achievement or a skill that can be developed? Where does happiness come from and how can it even be defined? In this series, Bobby Shuler challenges us to embrace a flourishing, happy life. Though philosophical, theological, and even controversial, Imagine Happiness will change the way you view the world, the Bible, and your own existence. This week, we have 10 DVDs to give away of Bobby Shuler's series called Imagine Happiness. If you've never contacted our New Zealand office before, email or call us today to make sure you get your copy of the Imagine Happiness DVD. Please contact us on 0800 14 HOPE. That's 0800 144 673. Or write to us, PO Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland 1344. Or hourofpower.org.nz. Don't forget, if you have a prayer need, please let us know, whether it's financial health or anything else. From me, Laurel McCulloch, and everyone here at Hour of Power in New Zealand, God loves you and so do we.